Howdy, my name's Daxio, and this is Plugged In News. In today's episode, for the first story, we got up to 1,500 businesses affected by ransomware attack, U.S. firm CEO says. Then for the next, we have China makes its move on Afghanistan. Beijing prepares to fill vacuum left by Biden's premature military exit from the nation with $62 billion investment plan for its Belt and Road program. And the last story is activist teachers brag about injecting race equity lessons in elementary classrooms. Let's get right into that. All right, and for the first story today, this comes from Yahoo Finance and Reuters. Uh, Up to 1,500 businesses affected by ransomware attack, U.S. firm CEO says. July 5th, between 800 and 1,500 businesses around the world have been affected by a ransomware attack centered on U.S. information technology firm Kaseya, its chief executive said on Monday. Fred Vacola, the Florida-based company's CEO, said in an interview that it was hard to estimate the precise impact of Friday's attack because those hit were mainly customers of Kaiseya's cu- customers. Kaiseya is a company which provides software tools to IT outsourcing shops, companies that typically handle back office work for companies too small or modestly resourced to have their own tech departments. One of those tools was subverted on Friday, allowing the hackers to paralyze hundreds of businesses on all five continents. Although most of those affected have been small concerns like dentist office or accountants, the disruption has been felt more keenly in Sweden, where hundreds of supermarkets had to close because their cash registers were not operated, or in New Zealand, where schools and kindergartens were knocked offline. The hackers who claimed responsibility for the breach have demanded $70 million to restore all the affected businesses' data, although they have indicated a willingness to temper their demands in private conversations with a cybersecurity expert and with Reuters. We are always ready to negotiate, a representative of the hackers told Reuters earlier Monday. The representative who spoke via a chat interface on the hackers' website did not provide their name. Vakola refused to say whether he was ready to take up on the hacker's offer. I can't comment yes, no, or maybe, he said when asked whether his company would talk or pay to the hackers. No comment on anything to do with negotiating with terrorists in any way. Uh, Personally, I don't think he should negotiate with terrorists just because that's what the U.S. doesn't do because that allows us to look vulnerable and that allows other people. I mean, what what just happened? We paid however many million dollars to those hackers that hacked uh, the pipeline or whatever. Or someone did. I I don't know if the U.S. directly did, but someone did. On to the next story. This comes from Daily Mail by James Gordon. Um, China makes its move on Afghanistan. Beijing prepares to fill the vacuum left by Biden's premature military exit from the nation with a $62 billion investment plan for its Belt and Road program. I'm pretty sure it's not only Biden's premature military exit. I'm pretty sure Trump started taking them out. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments below, but... I'm pretty sure Trump started taking out uh, American troops before Biden did. Anyways, while American troops were leaving their main military base in Afghanistan on Friday, China was already preparing to enter the war-torn country to fill the vacuum left by U.S. and NATO troops. Authorities in Kabul are considering extending a $62 billion China-Pakistan economic corridor as part of China's Belt and Road Initiative. First launched in 2013 by Chinese President Xi Jinping, and written into Chinese constitution in 2017, it is billed by Beijing officials as a global infrastructure development fund which aims to better connect China to the rest of the world. The Chinese entry comes amid threats from the Taliban to NATO to get out of Afghanistan by Joe Biden's September 11th deadline or face reprisals. Terror chief Suhail Shaheen said his men would not prefer to interfere with foreign diplomatic missions, but if that occupying forces remained, the Taliban were bound to react. More than a thousand Afghan troops fled across the northern border into neighboring Tajikistan on Monday after fighting with the resurgent Jihadists who are recapturing swaths of land across the country after U.S.-led coalition quit. China's new billion-dollar scheme in Afghanistan, aimed to be completed by 2049, is one of a number of targeted infrastructure projects which Beijing has rolled out from Africa to Europe, offering colossal loans and gaining footholds in territories once overseen by the West. This is really interesting because all China is doing is going into poor countries and making them go into debt by giving them loans and trying to give them critical infrastructure, and then China basically owns those countries or... Uh, just has them in debt. 
Anyways, China's been attempting to extend its BRI to Afghanistan for at least the last five years, but with the U.S. so heavily involved in the Afghani government, Kabul was hesitant to approve any deals, fearing upset in Washington. Now, once we leave, guess what they do? They want to basically uh, line themselves with our geopolitical enemy, which is China, and they're completely fine with it because they're getting critical infrastructure, so they really don't care. But now American troops have left the Bagram Air Base and China is about to be welcomed with open arms. What else can I say on that? And for our last story today, this comes from Breitbart News by Kyle Olson. It's activist teachers brag about injecting race equity lessons in elementary classrooms. It starts off by saying several King County, Washington activist teachers revealed to Crosscut how they inject race and equity lessons into their elementary classrooms. Kent teacher Joanne Barber took advantage of violent Black Lives Matter protests last year to teach more about race in her second grade class. I'm willing to be that teacher that has to go through those hard conversations, she said. I would be doing a huge disservice to my students if I didn't give them the information that they could see themselves in. She told Crosscut Learning that racial history is just as important as reading or math. Barber teaches children seven and eight years old that slavery led to institutional racism and implicit bias. I, at seven or eight years old, I wouldn't even understand what she's talking about. Like, I, I barely understood how government or any of that worked. Uh, she also weaves race and equity into every subject and every day in her class is filled with race education. Patricia Shelton, a curriculum developer in the Bellevue School District, told Crosscut, In Bellevue, we have been working very hard in grades 5, 8, and 11 to decenter the traditional white perspective and to center the voices of people of color. Shelton's colleague, equity specialist Shamari Jones, said she successfully removed work such as The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and To Kill a Mockingbird because they contained the N-word. There were so many instances of students feeling further oppressed by being in a classroom space where these books were being read aloud, he said. These have continued the racial trauma and racial stamina necessary for negatively impacted students to endure while attending school. Activists, teachers, and administrators have begun meeting resistance from teachers who argue such equity education is leftist indoctrination. Ground zero for that fight has been in Loudoun County, Virginia, a suburb of Washington, D.C. Angry parents attended a recent school board meeting to demand answers only to have board members flee and order police to remove the attendees. They're trying to teach our kids about institutional racism and implicit bias in like, while well, they're seven and eight years old, while well, I barely had a grasp of like, I, algebra, um, writing I, I could barely put together like a very good sentence i could write but like I, I i can nowhere near write as good as i can now like i don't i don't know yo thank you guys so much for watching today's video um i was just i, I took a long break that's it um i should be back on the videos now post nearly every day hopefully uh stay subscribed for more uh, peace out. Stay plugged in. Have a good one, guys.